Hello, my name is Forrest Neal. I'm a writer for Meditation Magazine, and today I have the fortunate opportunity of interviewing Sharon Salzberg. Sharon Salzberg is a New York Times bestselling author and teacher of Buddhist meditation practices in the West. In 1974, she co-founded the Insight Meditation Society in Barr, Massachusetts with Jack Kornfield and Joseph Goldstein. Today, we will be talking about the transformational power of her loving kindness practice. So thank you so much, Sharon, for coming on today. Oh, it's a great pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, I've really been looking forward to having this conversation for a long time, and uh, I'm very excited to see how it goes. And uh, fortunately, uh, before we began uh, this interview, we decided that starting off with a loving kindness practice would be a beautiful way to start uh, this conversation today. So feel free to go ahead and, and lead the practice. Great. Thank you. So um, I would invite everybody to sit comfortably, to close your eyes or not, however you feel most at ease, and just see if you can settle your energy, your attention into your body. And the way I like to do loving kindness practice is the silent repetition of certain phrases. So the phrases are like gift giving, they're offering to ourselves and to others. Instead of, for example, obsessing about our faults one more time, we actually kind of change channels and wish ourselves well. And with others, instead of taking them for granted or looking through them and kind of objectifying them, we take a moment to, in effect, look at them and wish them well through the phrases. It's not a practice where you have to try to conjure up or manufacture a special feeling. The power of the practice is actually from gathering all of our attention behind one phrase at a time. So I'll guide you through just one example of that. The first recipient classically is ourselves. So you might re repeat phrases like, may I be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. Live with ease means that the things of day-to-day -day life, like livelihood and family, may not be such a struggle. May I live with ease. May I be safe, be happy, be healthy live with ease. People often say to me, just because of the grammatical construction, like, who am I asking? We're not asking anybody anything. We're gift giving. We're offering. It's like you hand someone a birthday card and say, may you have a great year. It's a sense of blessing. May I be safe. Be happy. Be healthy. Live with ease. And if you find your attention wandering, which it commonly does, to the past, to the future, to judgment, to speculation, when you notice that you're no longer with the phrases, see if you can gently let go. It's what one of my teachers once called exercising the letting go muscle. See if you can gently let go. And without judgment or rancor, simply return your attention to the repetition of the phrases. So we let go and we begin again. And see if you can call to mind someone that we call a benefactor, that's someone who's helped you, 
Maybe they've helped you directly. They've helped pick you up when you've fallen down, or maybe they've inspired you from afar. This is like a, a symbol, a representation of the force of love for you. Could be an adult, could be a child, could be a pet. It's someone who, when you think of them, you smile. So if there's someone like that in your life, bring them here. You can get an image of them or say their name to yourself. Get a feeling for their presence and offer the phrases of loving kindness to them. Even if the words don't seem quite right, it doesn't matter because they're like the vehicle for the heart's energy. So they're serving us. May you be safe. Be happy. Be healthy. Live with ease. Maybe there's someone you know who's having a difficult time right now. Bring them here and offer the phrases of loving kindness to them. May you be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. Now let's have a gathering, just whoever comes to mind, friends, family, colleagues, those doing well, those not doing so well. We'll offer loving kindness to the collective, to the group. May you be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease.
and then all beings everywhere, all people, all creatures, all those in existence, near and far, known and unknown. May all beings be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. And when you feel ready, you can open your eyes or lift your gaze and we'll end the meditation. Wow, that was absolutely spectacular. Oh, <laughs> thank great. you thank so you. much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you all. All beings, thank you. Yes. Those... Uh... That was uh, about 10 minutes or so, and mm -hmm. and really it just seemed to fly by. <laughs> um, and for me, uh, the loving kindness practice is, uh, it always leaves me in a very loving space where, I, you know, I just feel so... Um, so complete and I feel like you know whatever happens to me throughout the day that I'm approaching it from a compassionate space and and uh, when I'm interacting with people I'm more more so coming into the interaction with a loving intention and it it just makes such a huge impact just these 10 minutes that um that it it really it has like a transformational effect and so that's that's definitely something that i wanted to ask you about um especially coming right out of the loving kindness meditation um it seems as if it's almost like a natural psychedelic experience where you in at certain times in meditation you know you you might be identifying certain aspects of your life or certain relationships that you have that make you feel uncomfortable in certain ways and when you share your feelings of well-wishing your loving intentions with those people or with those circumstances it it's like it flips your perspective of those things on its head mm -hmm. and and when your perspective changes like that um it it changes how you feel those feelings change the decisions that you make because now you feel connected in a way that you didn't before and then all of a sudden, maybe the people who you've had difficulties with, they begin treating you differently because you are now approaching the situation uh, more mindfully, more lovingly. And that causes just major changes in what we experience in life. And so I would like to know, um, why do you think that the loving kindness meditation practice appears to be so transformational. Well, you know, in, in the very classical perspective um, within the Buddhist context, they say that the Buddha taught it as the antidote to fear. And so you mm. think about that, you know, like, yeah, uh, you know, that, um, and it, it's also said uh, 
both you know from that context and, and in more current research that the part of the mind or the psyche that is most strongly impacted by doing loving kindness practice is the field of intention. Mm -hmm. And so if we have largely been governed by fear or alienation or resentment uh, in our choices, in our decisions, in our actions, and we do a practice like loving kindness, that will be replaced by a feeling of connection. Now that doesn't govern what we'll do, you know, which is always mm -hmm. very contextual. Like, will you say yes? Will you say no? Will you mm -hmm. lend this person money? Will you not? Will you, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, that's not almost like the um, arena of loving kindness. You know, that's based on wisdom and discernment and mm -hmm. what you see in the moment and a particular relationship and all of that. But why you'll do it, you know, will shift. And so that's like a huge upheaval in our lives to be coming from a place of, of connection and caring for ourselves and others. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, and as I was referring to, um, I, I've had experiences, especially during loving kindness, where I'll, you know, intentionally think about somebody who might have said something that was hurtful to me, or, um, you know, somebody who, who I worked with at the time, and maybe just have difficulties at work. Um, I remember I even had this idea to, um, we had this board uh, in the break room whenever I worked at a bookstore and on the board, everyone could write notes about why they were grateful to work with uh, certain employees. Um, and, and, during a loving kindness practice, I just got the idea that I would write a note and post it on the board for every single person who I worked with and that I wasn't just going to do it for the people who I was friends with, but that I would do it for literally everybody there. And whenever I did that, um, the people, everyone who I worked with saw it and you know, my bosses pulled me over and they were like, why did you do that? And, um, you know, no one else had, you know, 20 something notes that they put on the board. They only had, uh, you know, two or three that they wrote, but you kind of took up all the space on the board to write a note for everybody. And I just, I just said that, um, I just felt like I was in a loving space and that it was the right thing to do. And that whenever everyone saw that that happened, they kind of treated everybody else in the same way, leading uh, or following the example. And um, I was wondering if, you know, you might have any stories of interesting challenges or difficult circumstances that you've encountered where having a loving kindness meditation practice really transformed what you were experiencing or how you felt um, because of those difficult circumstances? Well, I mean, this, this is uh, not, this is a sort of more generic <laughs> difficult circumstance um, mm -hmm. in that, you know, certainly I have a strong, strong conditioning toward uh, self-judgment. And mm -hmm. one of the things I, I always try to point out about loving kindness practice is that let's say you have a regular meditation practice and you're, you're doing it, you know, 10 minutes a day or 15 minutes a day or something like that. You may not at all see the kind of progress or benefit in that 15 minutes, you know, mm -hmm. that, it will really show up where it counts, which is in your life. Mm -hmm. But I've seen so many people get frustrated through the years because we tend to look at that 15 minute period each day and say, well, you know, I've been meditating for two months and I still get sleepy or I still don't feel that great rush of love or whatever we expect, but really that's fine. And, um, 
you know, probably almost my signature story about loving kindness practice happened um, in 1976 when we first moved into the building that became the Insight Meditation Society. And um, I had first heard about loving kindness practice in January of 1971, which is when I first meditated. Uh, I was in India as a college student. I'd gone there to learn how to meditate. I did an intensive 10 day retreat, which was really like a mindfulness retreat led mm-hmm. by Yastan Goenka. And right at the very end, the last thing he did was a short loving kindness practice. And it was the first time I'd ever heard of it. And I thought, wow, you know, what is that? I was very taken with it. And um, I, uh, you know, thought, wow, I really want to learn more about this. And I didn't have the opportunity yeah. to go into it more deeply with a teacher and guidance, um, although I, I kept reading about it and studying it. Um, I, You know, the other didn't happen for me until 1985 when I went to Burma, but this is 1976. So those of us who were here in the very beginning of the Insight Meditation Society, uh, we had a month before there was any programming. And so we thought, okay, let's just do our own retreat for a mm-hmm. month. And I thought, hey, I've got a month. You know, I don't have a teacher here to guide me through loving kindness, but by this time I know how to do it. So I'm going to um, really do that. And so I spent the first week just doing loving kindness for myself, like all day long. May I be happy. May I be peaceful, whatever phrases I was using. And I felt absolutely nothing. It was like a completely dreary week. And then something happened to one of our friends in Boston, like in our larger community. And I had, amongst other people, we had to suddenly leave the retreat. And so I was up in one of the bathrooms getting ready to go to leave the retreat when I dropped this big jar of something, which just like went down on the tile floor and shattered and the stuff went everywhere. And I can remember the very first thought that came up in my mind was, you are really a klutz, but I love you. (laughs) And I thought, look at that. You could have given me anything in the course of that week. And I could not have honestly said something was happening, but something was happening. And, you know, I, I, I pair that often with a story about um, someone taking me out to lunch in New York City once and saying, uh, I just have to confess something. And I said, what? And, and he said <laughs> he had been doing loving kindness as his practice for about three years. And he said, you know, whether that was on retreat or he was sitting every day at home. And he said, I just have to say that my experience sitting like today, for example, is not that different than it was three years ago, but I'm like a different person. He said, I'm different with myself. I'm different with my family. I'm different with my community. I'm different ethically. And then he looked at me and he said, is that enough? And I said, yeah, I kind of think it's enough, you know? (laughs) So that's the way we discover the changes is by looking at our lives. Yes. Yes. And that's so interesting because, um, you know, it's like, well, when we grow up, naturally things happen that cause us to feel uncomfortable. And, um, you know, we, we might have these memories that give us negative emotions for one reason or another, because of how we have related with those experiences at that time. Um, and we're set up, we have everything that we need to, um, experience those loving emotions in our lives just by looking at the material that we've, uh, that we have within our own life experiences. I mean, you could probably sit for, you know, hours, uh, with this loving kindness practice and, um, find an untold amount of things that that pop up when you might ask yourself uh, a question like, well, what 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 makes me feel uncomfortable or um, what relationships have I had previously that didn't go how I would have liked for them to have gone? Um, you know, we could have like an infinite number of 
responses to something like that and and therefore so much material just to uh, express these loving emotions towards and then to feel them. Um, that kind of leads into my next question, which is that it's almost like it. I'm going to make a bit of a statement and I would like for you to maybe correct me if I'm wrong in my understanding uh, and, and feel free to add your own input in this as well. But whenever we have these uncomfortable feelings or feelings of fear or anger or frustration that we hold on to, um, it's it's as if there's like an egoic attachment to this feeling that we have and that by practicing loving kindness by letting go it's like we're letting go of that negative attachment so it frees us from being dragged around by our negative emotions that we might experience from time to time and that it kind of gives us a clarity of perspective that really just makes it clear how awesome it is th the life that we're living like how awesome it is the present moment that we're experiencing you know even you know living the lives that we're living now sometimes it doesn't seem that awesome because we're just so caught up in the in our past or things that we might be going through currently but that by spreading loving kindness to these difficult circumstances, it allows us to let go of them so that we can be more present and appreciate uh, life, you know, in, in an amazing way for what it is. How would, what would you say to um, a statement like that? Well, I think there's lots of levels to that. You know, um, mm -hmm. I think that, over time, we we probably stop thinking of those particular emotions, you know, greed, anger, fear, jealousy, mm -hmm. uh, as negative and more recognize them as painful. Yes. You know, they're negative if, if they overcome us, if we get overwhelmed by them, and especially if they drive us to action, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but the opposite extreme of that is, you know, one of those feelings arises and we add shame and fear and dislike, mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of identification. Like, this is really me instead of seeing it as a changing state and um, things like that. Um, you know, so to be able to see those feelings, have compassion for ourselves instead of judgment is also a function of greater loving kindness. Mm -hmm. and, and the compassion, you know, a lot of times we confuse that kind of compassion with weakness. Like that means, oh, I'm just going to give yeah. in and let mm -hmm. it run rampant and, you know, let it take me over and stuff like that. And it it really doesn't mean that at all. You know, it's like um, a, a very particular way of relating where we can recognize what's going on, realize that if, if it takes over, we're sunk in some way, you know. And yeah. it's just going to cause a lot of suffering. And we want a relationship to it. We're, we're neither pushing it away nor getting lost in it. And that's um, what we do, you know. And so it, mm -hmm. it's how the loving kindness functions. And it points to one of the great controversies about loving kindness or compassion, which is the idea that it's a weakness, you know, that it'll bring us down, that it'll have us, it's just a kind of sentimentality and, and, uh, you know, applied to ourselves, it means laziness applied to others. It means just giving in and, um, neither of those is true. If you were to share this exercise with somebody who maybe hasn't had really any experience with meditation before, Mm -hmm. but that they're interested, they understand what you're, um, that, you know, they might hear this conversation and they, they understand conceptually what we are talking about. And so they would like to learn more. Um, and, and let's say, you know, you had the opportunity to guide this person through a loving kindness meditation so that they could really see for themselves 
the value of a practice like this, how would you guide them through that? Like, for example, whenever I first learned it, uh, there was like we would prepare our minds and bodies. We would uh, we would do some just basic stretches or do some yoga and then we would do a silent meditation. And then those two things would kind of like supercharge our minds to be prepared for the love and kindness meditation. And, and I don't know if that's like maybe an, an overly extreme way of practicing it, but you know, if you wanted to share this with somebody in a very impactful way, how would you personally go about doing that? Well, I think, you know, a, a critical thing is to understand what to expect and what not to expect. Otherwise, mm-hmm. you just get discouraged. So part of it is what I was talking about before. You know, you might not see big changes in your formal practice each uh-huh. day, you know, but uh, you can look at your life. And I would say don't do that every second, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, uh, you know, what seems to help people, including me, is having some kind of structure, like I'm going to make the experiment. I'm going to practice this. Uh, I'm going to say 12 minutes a day or 15 minutes a day um, Mm -hmm. for a month. And -hmm. at the end of the month, I'm just going to wait till then to check out. Well, you know, that's interesting. How was I meeting this stranger and how was I talking to myself and how was I in this situation where I normally get really anxious and, stuff like that, you know, so you don't want to check it out like every single second because then you'll freak out, you know, like, oh, is that enough, Mm -hmm. you know? Uh, Yeah. It also has to be a reasonable structure. Like, I'm, I'm, you know, you don't want to say I'm going to do this for four years and, you know, and then check it Mm -hmm. out. And you don't want to say I'm going to do this six hours a day because that's unreal. Mm -hmm. And so I was talking to one neuroscientist who's very prominent in the field of meditation research and he said uh, in his lab that they found seven to nine minutes a day will actually change your brain. So that's measurable changes mm-hmm. in an fMRI machine. And I was um, I was doing a, a Zoom presentation and, uh, for this panel, and this other neuroscientist friend was on the panel, and I could see her face when I was quoting him, and she didn't look that happy. So I said to her, okay, what do you think? And she said, well, my lab found 12 minutes a day, you know, so Mm. nobody knows. And it's not Mm -hmm. an exact number. um, And it may not be that healthy to go for the bare minimum, but yeah, (laughs) I I think what's really interesting is that nobody is saying you have to do the 16 hours a day to get a result. You know, mm, so yeah. if you can commit to 15 minutes a day, every day for two weeks or a month, whatever seems right to you, then then that would be a way to approach it. You are a New York Times bestselling author. So there are definitely significant goals that you have achieved with the uh, great work that you are doing. And I'm wondering... Because of the great goals that you have, um, maybe there's a couple of questions in here, but how are you able to manage um, the your ability to accomplish great things like becoming a New York Times bestselling author while maintaining a sense of self-compassion um, that, that many people, you know, we, we would maybe, I know for sure I do. Um, and I'm sure many other people do as well. You know, we, we have voices in our heads that are constantly telling us, you know, how we messed up and, and, um, why we're, we're not good enough whenever things don't go the way that we want them to. Um, but it just seems not so much like a paradox, more so of an interesting predicament that um, the the work that you are doing, you know, has allowed you to uh, experience great achievements like the New York Times bestselling list, while at the same time, the material that you're writing about is talking about sharing love and self-compassion, which 
it seems almost kind of contradictory in certain ways to one's ability to achieve in that, you know, we always want to um, do more or do better. Um, and I guess I'm just wondering, like, how, how do you manage your ability to feel very self-compassionate while achieving goals that many people only achieve through constant desire to do better and that things aren't actually good enough? Um, I think that, you know, the conventional understanding of self-compassion is a kind of laziness or complacence. And, you Mm -hmm. know, I've taught it and uh, I don't think there was a single time that I, I talked about it um, where someone hadn't raised their hands and said, well, that's just laziness, you know, mm-hmm. that's like making a mistake and saying, oh, I'll forgive myself. And two seconds later, you make another mistake and you say, so what, you know, I'll just forgive myself again. But I think it functions very differently than that. And I don't know uh, particular research studies to talk about, but I'm told by scientists that the research uh, very strongly points to the idea that um, if you do a performance study of any kind on somebody, that a harsh punitive environment, either internal or external, will spike our performance, but briefly, then we'll crash. Mm -hmm. And that the best way to have a sustained effort to make a change, to learn something new, to change a habit, to make progress in something is actually self-compassion that Mm -hmm. if you just go back to the meditation we did as an example, Mm -hmm. you know, you're sitting, uh, your intention is to place your attention on the repetition of those phrases. And the next thing, you know, you're thinking about dinner or, you know, like, Mm -hmm. uh, whether you're going to take a vacation or not. And, and then comes that moment when you realize like, Oh, you know, I haven't, repeated a phrase in some time. So what do we do in that moment? Very commonly, just by force of habit, we start judging ourselves. You know, I can't do this well. Everyone else is better than I am. And, uh, you know, they're not thinking all these people I learned meditation with, they're sitting there in bliss and I'm just a loser. And I'm just, you know, I can't, I can't do this well. And I'm so distracted and this is so awful. And we go on and on. And when we get lost in that, not only are we adding sometimes a considerable period of time to the distraction, but we're so demoralized. We're so exhausted. We don't have the ability to like pick up and start over. And that's why we call mm-hmm. meditation training, like a resilience training. And mm-hmm. the secret ingredient of that is self-compassion. It helps us pick ourselves up. And that doesn't mean we're ignoring the problem. It's like maybe lessons learned or, this is what I need to do to try to make amends. But the really important thing is to be able to start over and like pick up the thread, you know, mm-hmm. and, and keep going. And that's how we make progress. That's how we learn. And so uh, if you look at really what our habits tend to be in terms of um, just that kind of self-judgment and self-criticism and realize that it's not useful, it's actually not a skillful way of being then it becomes intriguing. Like what happens when I blow it and I am kind to myself and Mm -hmm. I pick myself up and start over and you realize, Oh, that's not laziness at all. That's like Mm -hmm. a significantly different and far more effective way of getting something done. And I will just say in terms of being a New York times bestselling author, uh, that is like a, a dream come true or something like that. That's not something I set out. I at any rate would ever set out to do because so many things happen in the course Mm of publishing a book, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And so uh, it's, it's like great good fortune and I'm very grateful for it. But um, at the same time, you know, I never imagined it would happen. And I think I would have been, immensely gratified by uh, just somebody coming up and saying to me, you know, your book was really helpful to me, or I used your book in Mm -hmm. this really, really difficult period of my life. And 
it would be a shame if I was so hell bent on being a New York Times bestselling author and that didn't happen. And I then disregarded all these other things and thought, not good enough, you know. Due to a technical difficulty, the remainder of this interview was not saved as a recording. I greatly enjoyed speaking with Sharon, and if you enjoyed our conversation, subscribe to Meditation Magazine at meditationmag.com to see more interviews like this one.